Warning. This podcast contains discussions of violence and sex. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Something Wicked, a bonus series from the Three Ravens podcast, all about historical monsters, maniacs and murderers from across the world of folklore. My name's Martin Vaux. I'm a storyteller, writer and English romanticism obsessive, and I'm joined, as ever, by my partner in crime and all dark arts, Eleanor Conlon. Hello! So, for this episode, I wanted to talk about what was probably the most famous murder trial in Victorian England. It's a less well-known case today compared to, say, spring Jack or Jack the Ripper, both of which are maybe more notorious by virtue of the fact that the perpetrators in both of those cases were never caught. It's interesting that you mention both of those cases, because, of course, they definitely are folkloric yeah. to the extent that people kind of associated them with the supernatural and the paranormal. Mm. But did the Red Barn murder take place around about the same time? Well, Jack the Ripper came much later. He was active in 1888, whereas spring Hill Jack was 1837, and the Red Barn murder predates them both, taking place in 1828. Okay, so much earlier. Yeah, but one piece of interesting connective tissue, as it were, is that James Lee, the London police officer who ultimately arrested the villain in the Red Barn murder, was later put in charge of the spring Hill Jack investigation. Wow, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, it definitely is, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. We haven't yet named our murderer, let alone describe some of the grotty nastiness associated with him. Eleanor, when you think about the Red Barn murder, is there anything that jumps to mind? Well, yes. Um, my dad got very interested in it, and he actually has a little ceramic model of the Red Barn. Mm. So I think about that on his bookshelf. Yeah. Uh, but also, um, I think the case has some things in common with the murder of Mary Ann Weems, which I spoke about in our Huntingdonshire yes. episode. So, including that Thomas Weems, the murderer in that case, was experimented on after his death. And I think that happened after the Red Barn murder trial. Mm. And I'm also right in thinking that Thomas Weems and the murderer in the Red Barn case were both skinned and their skin was used to bind books. Spot on, yeah. So when it comes to the Red Barn murders, our villain is a man named William Corder, also known by his nickname Foxy Corder. Foxy? Well, that could imply a couple of things. Yeah. Um, that he was sneaky and maybe that he was a bit of a hit with the ladies. So Foxy as in attractive. Well, both of those things were definitely the case. Foxy Corder, aka William Corder, was a known heartbreaker and small time criminal in his hometown of Polstead in Suffolk, where he was born in 1803. When you say small-time criminal, he obviously goes on to become a killer. Yeah. But uh, what are the small crimes that really got him started? Well, he was mostly engaged in pig-based shenanigans. Excuse me? Yeah, so things like fraudulently selling other people's oh. pigs as if they were his pigs, stealing pigs, uh, a little bit of forgery here and there. All told, he wasn't terribly good at being a criminal, and his friend and accomplice, Samuel Smith, also known as Beauty Smith. Another handsome criminal, this, this part of yeah. Suffolk. So, Excellent. So Beauty Smith said of Corder when Smith was being interrogated by the police after one of these big based heists, I'll be damned if he'll not hang one of these days. Well, that's a bit prophetic. It was indeed, because of course Corder did hang, but not until a few years afterwards, and not because of theft, but because of murder, most horrid. And going back to that book made of his skin. Yes. You can still see that, can't you? Yes, you can indeed. Along with a load of other bits and pieces associated with the case, many of which are kept at Moises Hall Museum in Bury St Edmunds, a town fabled with myths and legends, not least as the birthplace of one of the age's great cultural icons, by which I mean you. Yeah, famous for me and <laughs> wolves and the book made of William Corder's skin. <laughs> and the Moises Hall Museum has loads of other Red Barn murder stuff, including William Corder's death mask. There are a few of those floating about. Corder's pistols and items owned by the woman he murdered, 
Maria Martin. Now, I confess, I don't know an awful lot about Maria Martin. Mm. Although not long ago, I became a bit obsessed with Hallie Rubenhold and Alice Fiennes' work around Jack the Ripper's victims. Yes. And I heartily recommend their podcast, Bad Women. Mm. I mention it because so often we think more about the murderer or the perpetrator in these gory cases rather than the victims. And we risk glorifying these monstrous people. Yeah. So in the case of Maria Martin, what, what can we say about her? What do we know? Well, we actually know loads about her. And one of the most interesting things about Maria Martin, Corder's victim, is that in the Ferrari surrounding the case, including all the newspapers and pamphlets and penny dreadfuls and ballad sheets and so on, Maria Martin is made out to be a kind of angelic victim of Foxy Corder. Whereas, not one to make things too awkward, but turns out she wasn't exactly as white and pure as the driven snow. Okay, the plot thickens. <laughs> so Maria was four years older than William Corder, and she'd had two children from two different men before they entered into their relationship. The first... Thomas Henry survived her. He was a product of Maria's relationship with a local Suffolk man called Peter Matthews, while her second child, who died in infancy, was actually the son of William Corder's older brother, Thomas. See, I always find it a little bit creepy when the same person has relationships with siblings within the same family. Yeah, it's kind of weird, isn't it? It's a bit of a trope in Victorian fiction, though, including in Thomas Hardy's novels. Yeah. So I guess it was just seen as more normal or acceptable at this point in history. But, I don't know, the idea of having a child with one brother, then shacking up with another brother, it just strikes me as a little bit odd. Yeah, I mean, in this case, not only does Maria Martin shack up with two brothers from the same family, but she also has children from both brothers. Uncle Daddy. <laughs> yes, well... So, in 1826, when all of this really kicks off, you have basically a rush of bad luck for the Corder family because Maria has a child by Thomas Corder, then the child dies, and then Thomas Corder dies, meaning Maria is pregnant again with William Corder's baby, and then their baby also dies not long after childbirth. Wow, that is a rough run of luck. Yeah, it absolutely is. And that's only half of it, actually, because the timeline goes back a bit further in that William Corder aka Foxy is sent to London by his father after his pig related crimes were discovered then is called back to Suffolk when his oldest brother dies from drowning trying to cross a frozen lake and this kind of kicks off 18 months of bad luck for the Corders with Corder's father and all three of his brothers dying then William Corder of course also dying after being found guilty for Maria Martin's murder my goodness so the number of deaths here includes uh, Maria Martin, yeah. two of her children and five other members of the Corder family. Indeed. And it's worth mentioning that we have no evidence whatsoever that William Corder was involved in the death of his brothers or his father. But we do know that by 1826, he was the sole surviving Corder male, which left him to run the family farm with his mother. And I'm guessing it's during this time he enters into the relationship with Maria Martin. Yeah, exactly right. So Maria gets pregnant and has his baby in 1827 but their baby dies. And it's commonly believed that Martin and Corda killed the child and buried it in an unmarked grave near Sudbury. And based on Corda's eventual confession, it was the potential murder of this child and the disposal of the corpse of this newborn that ultimately led to Corda killing Martin. What a mess. I find mm. it very interesting to consider that Maria Martin was framed in the public consciousness as this kind of innocent victim when it seems like she wasn't entirely free from guilt, perhaps. No, I mean, you and I are pacifists and don't advocate for capital punishment under any circumstances, but the narrative of the villainous man and innocent woman suited the press. And it's worth saying that Maria Martin was, as I said, older than William Corder. And according to Corder, who wasn't exactly trustworthy, there's some suggestion that her attempts to kind of blackmail him led in part to the, her death. Okay, so maybe we have two not entirely lovely people yeah. here. 
But the case is called the Red Barn Murder. So I'm presuming <laughs> a barn comes into the narrative at some point. Yes. So the rough timeline is as follows. In late 1827, after their child has been secretly buried, there's a meeting between Corda, Maria and Maria's stepmother, Anne Martin, at the Martins' house, where William Corder allegedly promised to marry Maria. But because they feared that the law were after them, them, basically because their illegally born bastard baby had just disappeared, Corda suggested they flee to the nearby town of Ipswich. Their plan went that Maria would meet Corda at the Red Barn, which is about half a mile from the Martins' cottage, where she would affect a disguise, dressing like a man, so the two could then evade the law and elope. Okay, so the subterfuge already. This is interesting. Yeah, then some weeks go by and uh, Corda has written to Anne Martin, Maria's stepmother, to say that life is good, the couple are happily married, living in Ipswich, everything's going fine, no reason to worry at all. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to go out on what I think is quite a sturdy limb here and say <laughs> things weren't fine. No, they weren't because after a few weeks of exchanging letters and Anne informing William that the law wasn't after him or Maria and that they could safely come home now, the correspondence became a little strained, we might say. That's to say that uh, initially William said that Maria couldn't write herself because she'd hurt her hand and then he said that she'd actually written, but, you know, the letter must have been lost in the post. Then he wrote to say that they were now living on the Isle of Wight, so no need to come and visit us. And then the letters stopped coming and William just disappeared. Hmm, pretty darn suspicious. <laughs> I can see what you mean when you say he wasn't a terribly good criminal. <laughs> no. And um, do we know what he actually did next? Presuming he didn't move to the Isle of Wight. Well, like the cunning cad and bounder he was, William Corder put out an advert in the Lonely Hearts column of three newspapers, The Times, The Morning Herald and The Sunday Times, so all London papers, where he had over 200 responses. Foxy by name, Foxy by nature. <laughs> and he married one of the women who responded to his advert, a woman called Mary Moore, who owned a ladies boarding house in Brentford, where William Corder took up shop and, all told, was a bit of a hit with the all-female clientele. Oh my goodness, William. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, and this is where the case gets really interesting from a Three Ravens perspective, because back up in Suffolk for many months, Anne Martin, Maria's stepmother, had been dreaming about Maria's ghost appearing to her. And this, of course, made Anne believe that Maria wasn't happily in Ipswich or the Isle of Wight or anywhere else, but that she was, in fact, rather dead. Then did Anne share her suspicions with the police at the time? Yes, she did. With the constable in Polstead, a man named Ayers, um, sort of then setting about trying to trace Maria's whereabouts. I'm guessing he didn't have much luck. No, he didn't. But luckily, Maria's ghost eventually made it very clear where she was buried, namely in the aforementioned Red Barn, where Anne had her husband, Thomas Martin, so Maria's father, dig up the floor to reveal, drumroll, Maria's decomposing corpse. Oh, God. And could they tell how she died? Well, they did an inquest at the pub, actually, which is called The Cock Inn. It's in Polstead. You can still go there today, have a drink and some dinner. Anyway, um, so they struggled to pin down the precise cause of death because she was a little ripe by then, as I'm sure you can imagine. But she'd been buried in a sack and had a terrible wound through the eye, initially thought to be a stab wound, as well as other injuries. But she was wearing some of Foxy Corder's clothing, which pointed the finger squarely in his direction. Okay, so now they know they're looking for William Corder, yeah. but back in this day and age, when people moved across county lines, I'm guessing it was pretty difficult to track them down. Well, yes, but not that difficult if you've put out a Lonely Hearts advertisement in three of the nation's leading newspapers. Oh, he's such an idiot. <laughs> you would change your name, yeah, wouldn't you? Yeah, you would. Wouldn't yeah. you? You'd become a fake person, wouldn't you? That, you be yeah, just, just or become one of your dead brothers. Just just anything except your yeah. own name. <laughs> so because Corder had actually been in London before, if you remember, he was sent there after the, the pig theft, that is where Ayers thought to look first. Uh, and he teamed up with James Lee, he of Spring Hill Jack fame, and they eventually tracked Corder down and arrested him at Mary Moore's boarding house. Oh, I bet that was quite the scene. It was indeed. 
Actually, Thomas Hardy wrote a later account of it for the Dorset Chronicle, which described how Corda was found in a dressing gown in the kitchen, holding a pocket watch by which he was timing the cooking of boiled eggs for the various ladies in the boarding house. <laughs> Brilliant. I'm just imagining him in a kimono, surrounded by luscious women. <laughs> Don't worry, sweet ladies, your eggy eggs will be ready soon if my name isn't Foxy Corda. <laughs> <laughs> now, once arrested, Corda was quickly transported back to Suffolk, but the case was instantly a national sensation. This is, of course, the age of the penny dreadful and so on. And the idea of this ghost having appeared to help solve its own murder case really caught the public imagination. Naturally, it's excellent. But all this led to mobs of people heading to Suffolk to witness the trial, which took place at Bury St Edmunds. The trial had to be ticketed because so many people wanted to attend all, all the Hotels and boarding houses in Bury St Edmunds were booked up, and it's said that a crowd of 7,000 people gathered around the courthouse during the trial. That is quite a few people. It is. I mean, it said over 30,000 people processed with Lord Byron's body from London up to Oakham when he was eventually interred. So it wasn't mega ultra big for mobs of the day, but by the time it came for Corda to be executed, it's estimated the crowds had grown to 20,000 people who eventually watched Corda hang. And to be clear, Anne Martin's story about the ghost was part of the trial. Oh yeah, she was a key witness. And uh, Corda's defence was that he hadn't wanted to marry Maria Martin and that she had been blackmailing him into it and that he'd argued with her in the Red Barn, but then just left and happened to hear gunshots over his shoulder as he walked away. I'm sure... Everyone in the jury was completely convinced by that. Well, the jury made up their minds after deliberating for just 35 minutes, so not really. <laughs> and did he eventually confess to how he'd actually killed her? Yes, so once he was condemned, his wife, Mary Moore, convinced him to confess to the priest, and he eventually said that he had shot her through the eye, hence the eye injury, but hadn't meant to, as basically they were arguing, he was threatening her, and then bang. Sure. Sure. Okay, Foxy Corda. <laughs> oh, I shot her in the head, but I didn't mean to, Your Holiness, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> well, quite. But even then, Corda was still trying to cash in. So he sold a murder ballad about it, giving the proceeds to his soon-to-be widow. Oh, that is amazing. Yeah. Writing your own murder ballad. Right. So I couldn't find the original, original version of it, but there are a number of versions of the ballad, which has endured for almost 200 years now, and it's still quite a popular folk song. But it's worth adding that this was the time of sensationalist theatre and so on. So plays of Frankenstein, for example, had been in performance since the early 1820s and plays of the Red Barn murder were actually on all across the country while the trial was still taking place. Wow. I mean, if there's money to be made, I suppose. Yeah, and even once Corda was hanged, the furore did not die down. We said earlier that his skin was used to bind a book. Yes, an account of the trial and case, actually. How brilliantly macabre. Mm. And then his body was experimented on. Yeah, so he was dissected at the University of Cambridge, where his body was variously electrocuted, following the model of Galvani's experiments, which inspired Mary Shelley. And his skull was studied by leading phrenologists, while several death masks were made, as mentioned, including one which is kept at Norwich Castle. Oh, actually. well, we love Norwich. The, the castle was closed for renovations when we went earlier this year, yeah. so we'll have to go back and give Foxy Corda a look. Yeah, definitely. And then what happened to the rest of his body once they'd done the experiments? Well, his skeleton was actually kept right up until 2004, first at West Suffolk Hospital, where it was rigged up with a mechanism which had the skeleton point at a collection <laughs> box for donations to the hospital whenever anyone stepped on a like nearby pressure plate. Oh, that is brilliantly gross. <laughs> yeah, it it's is. gross, but it's also amazing. Yeah, it is. And then it was displayed at the Royal College of Surgeons for many years, alongside the skeleton of the criminal mastermind, also known as the Great Corrupter, Jonathan Wilde. 
I never heard of Jonathan Wilde. Who was he? Oh, he's such a fascinating person. He was kind of a gangster, kind of a gang leader in London, who was also a vigilante. He called himself the Thief Taker General. And he was a kind of folk anti-hero, basically, during the 18th century. Anyway, what's really interesting is that a man named John Kilner, who was one of the most ardent collectors of Red Barn memorabilia, actually bought Corder's skull to add to his collection. Only Kilner was allegedly haunted by Corder's ghost, leading to the skull being given a Christian burial, the rest of the skeleton eventually being cremated, this is in 2004, and Kilner's collection forming the basis of the exhibit now on display at Moises Hall Museum in Bury St Edmunds. Oh, excellent. Foxy Corder still making trouble after the turn of the millennium. <laughs> yeah. As for memorabilia, am I right in thinking that the Red Barn murders were kind of a crazy time for, well, merchandise? Absolutely. Not only were hundreds of thousands of replica small clay red barns made. Your dad has one of these Mm -hmm. small clay red barns. Um, And there was also loads of cameos and things like that made to mark the occasion. But famously, the Red Barn itself became a kind of shrine or tourist attraction with people visiting and taking a piece of the barn with them after they'd visited. So much so that the barn was almost completely dismantled before the last ruins of it were demolished in 1842, with many of the planks taken from the barn split and sold as commemorative Toothpicks. That's so strange. I know, right? Interestingly, with the um, with this clay barn, yes. the one my dad has is just the barn itself. Yeah. But there are versions of it that also have a tiny William Corder and Maria Martin yeah. on, and the uh, the ornament, but uh, they apparently are worth much more. Oh, they are expensive. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. They are collector's items for sure. Um, and maybe even more macabre, Maria Martin's grave. Now, that was also a pilgrimage site with visitors coming and chiseling away at her tombstone bit by bit to the point where eventually there was no stone left on her grave at all. Oh, oh no, Paul Maria. Yeah. I, I'm presuming it's been replaced since. No, it's just a small plaque in the churchyard of St Mary's Church in Polstead. And did the theatrical angle die down? You said there were lots of plays about it going on at yeah, the time. Yeah, not for a long time. So Charles Dickens wrote a story about it. Vaughan Williams included it in two operas. And the play, based on the case, which also appeared in freak shows and peep shows all over the country, became the most performed play of the mid-Victorian era. That's amazing. What an incredible story. Yep, a nasty murder solved by a ghost that became a national sensation. How interesting. Well, thank you so much, Martin. And do you know what you're going to cover in our Something Wicked episode for Haunting Season? Yeah, we're going to dig into the rather grim case of the Candyman, a.k.a. Ronald Clark O'Brien, otherwise known as the man who killed Halloween. Well, that sounds suitably disturbing. (laughs) In the meantime, If you would like additional and bonus content, as well as all of our episodes ad-free, then do please consider supporting us for $3 a month or $6 a month via patreon.com forward slash 3 Ravens podcast. And of course, do please follow us on social media via facebook.com forward slash 3 Ravens podcast, Instagram at 3 Ravens podcast, or on Twitter via at 3 Ravens pod. Until next time, while our tale of terror has gone that way, we'll go this way and remember don't whistle till you're out of the woods our theme song is the traditional folk ballad three ravens performed by eleanor conlon and ben harbour and our logo is by ollie james dare the three ravens podcast is a rust and stardust production written and produced by me martin vox thanks for listening God sent every gentleman Such hounds, such hawks, and such lean man With a down, derry, derry, derry